with the shiver. Waiting inside the principal's office, he tried to find the right face. Smug Dillinger mug, calm Capone aplomb. Outside, his mom bargained for the soul of her lawless son again. Then the word expulsion broke into the room, clobbered his ears, and left him there encased in fear like Han Solo carbon frozen. But he wasn't alone. On the wall hung a wood engraving of a glum nun drooping with Jesus, Angela of Foligno. She too awaited judgment. Perhaps she didn't deface pews or set Barbie dolls ablaze with aerosol cans, but she too shivered in Big Brother's perfect shadow. She too polished sorrows like secret fangs in her cell. So he fancied her his wild patron, he was a monster trapped in an ice slab of trouble and Angela, his guardian gargoyle, mushed a sled of St. Bernard's come to rescue him. As the doorknob clicked his childhood shut, he settled on a martyred look. Icing on the cake. On his 10th birthday, he unwrapped the Kobe Bryant action figure he'd begged for. As he ripped the box open, his dad whipped into a fit. No, 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 you've killed its value. It's supposed to stay in the packaging. So he played with his worthless gift guiltily while his dad barked how the birthday was ruined. He saw his mom put on her death mask of wax, nodding, perfectly disguised as a person alive and listening. He didn't yet think of St. Angela's corpse her incorrupt body on display like a pharaoh's slave, mummified, perfectly preserved in its museum case. Older now, he sees his mother's face looking at him as if through the frozen surface of a lake. Was it I who led you to the hole, to this hopeless split in the ice? Her stare as stiff as a net's bottomless swish. Kobe's flicked wrist fixed eternally mid-air. Ice Breakout Grandma lay feeble and furry, her toothless mouth cavernous. His parents had dragged him on this last family cave visit to say goodbye to the dying beast. If you don't pet your grandmother, Dad threatened, no video games and no ice cream after dinner forever. So he petted away, scowling, his own hair spilling through the holes in his jeans. Each aunt, uncle, and cousin lined up to pat her belly and coo into her ear who should receive her prized ice crystal jewelry. His Game Boy shielded him as the adults, drinking and chomping ice cubes, bickered over Grandma's estate. That night, he snuck to the kitchen for more ice cream, but found Grandma. How long has the freezer been open? His teeth chattered. We're busting out of this joint, she gummed. We'll ride the ice blocks down the mountain to Old Jim's ranch, steal a couple horses, and hightail it to the city. Her eyes flared for some cryptid sibling long buried in the family crypt. Brother, she said. Yes, Grandma? What big teeth you have. The Incorruptible. Who is watching him as he sits, stoned, still on the couch? TV gangster legends engraving his dreams with their crimes. Thinking his mind is cut to the likes of Legs Diamond, he feels eyes, their eyes, like ice picks trying to spike his skull. The way Everest climbers feel the Yeti's ruby-eyed gaze as they fall. He had so much potential, they all said, but they couldn't see his was the potential energy of a guillotine's high-hanging blade. He almost smiles as he recalls raining terror on his friends. Ah, the great snowball battle of 98. He remembers nailing, 
Was it Jack? Was the name Jack Ruby? It's slushy in his head, as if carved into a melting glacier. This stuff makes his memory as tangled as Yeti fur, makes him feel as if the fuzz is always closing in, makes him believe the impossible. I'm as innocent as a saint. But even saints must be corruptible. How else to measure our fall? No, he didn't cast the first snowball at all. It's getting clearer now how the others turned on him, blasted him square in the eye, how the snow fell from his face, stone cold as the saintly sneer of Robespierre when his head dropped into the bucket. his ice age. One night, his dad decided he was too old to be tucked in, so under the bed he crawled into the cave dark to wonder at his dad's old shaved yeti centerfolds. But as he hunted deeper into crumpled report card tundra past his so-called snow globe collection, abandoned, whole worlds toppled and cracked open like tossed skulls and caved-in catacombs, he heard the call, or rather the weak coo of his own voice, coming from a man who lay stiff, soul case grown to full yetihood, with monstrous eyes, red like his own, whose secrets wouldn't let them shut, not even a whisper of this, they said. And in that look he understood and found solace that the Yeti remained at large before the world froze over because it hid from itself. And he saw that its footprints in the snow led to a home with a mom and dad fighting the cold that grew between them, that the evidence for people's natural goodness was so loose it could avalanche at any moment, that even a whisper could without warning dislodge frostbitten loved ones from the cabin heart, plunge them into some icy abyss. And he saw why fools once called the peaceful yeti a beast, savage and soulless, because the mere existence of a spirit so fiercely unsolvable is a source of terror to cities so small-souled they fit snug in a snow globe stuffed under a boy's bed. The man closes his eyes as sleep approaches, fur-soled, its claws like stolen rubies clacking dimly on cold tile, as mom's heels once did in the hallway. He has not quite crossed the crevasse, or has he, into dream, when a boy who shares his face lies face up beside him like a fossil in a solid block of ice.